on this episode of the Oklahoma Breakdown with Iker and Layman, presented by Riverwind Casino. We give you the latest updates on OU's coaching staff and roster in the National College Football Roundup. We update the college football QB carousel, discuss Gary Patterson possibly joining the Texas staff, and give you some of our final thoughts heading into Alabama, Georgia. We finish up giving you our winners and losers of the weekend. Please download and subscribe to the podcast, rate it five stars, and write us a good review. Follow the show on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. Just search Oklahoma Breakdown on any of those, and you'll find us. All right. Our man, Michael Hosty will kick this thing off. It's time for the Oklahoma Breakdown. It's a beautiful Monday, January 10th, and you're listening to the Oklahoma Breakdown with Iker and Lehman, presented by Riverwind Casino. Riverwind is Oklahoma City's premier casino experience, and your health and safety are Riverwind's number one priorities. There are so many reasons why Riverwind is consistently voted OKC's number one casino, but it all starts with their amazing variety of gaming thrills and excitement. Riverwind's beautiful award-winning environment plays host to more than 2,800 of the latest electronic games with a huge selection of table games, including Blackjack, Blackjack Match, Roulette, and Teddy's favorite, Craps. No matter what your game, Riverwind has it in spades and hearts. And Fridays in January from 6 p.m. to midnight, you can win your share of $80,000 in cash and bonus play in Riverwind's $80,000 Rockin' and Reelin' giveaway. Drawings are every 30 minutes, and grand prize winners will be selected at 11:59. If you need help finding your way, just visit Riverwind.com, Riverwind Casino, still the one. Now, recording this Sunday night, please leave us a five-star review and a nice comment. You can email the Oklahoma Breakdown at gmail.com if you want to sponsor the podcast. Ted, the YouTube. It's, it's gaining traction, and y- you want to know the main reason I know that? Because wow. about 50 people told me that I forgot to change the year. It still said 2021 <laughs> on the YouTube video, and uh. I, I knew it when, when I uploaded it. I saw it. I was like, oh, no. Maybe no one will notice. Yeah, not, uh, not so fast. Like 25 people were like, hey, you forgot to change the year. I was like, I know. I, I, I'm stupid. But if you want to watch the podcast, Check it out or check out our YouTube page. You can just search the Oklahoma breakdown. You'll find it and you can criticize us, I suppose. <laughs> Look at the person that's uh, spewing the anger. Yeah, it's good. Okay. So a couple show notes, because this is the time of the year. Uh, we start having a few more guests on because we don't have the OU games to talk about it. It, it does get pretty fun. So Wednesday, our plan is to record something with future NFL Hall of Famer Joe Thomas. We're going to talk about the Browns, Baker's future with the Browns. So that should be a fun conversation with Joe T. Next Sunday, Perrion Winfrey scheduled to join yeah. us. Yeah. Which okay. Uh, how weird could that get? Let's let's we'll, we'll see I where think, that goes. Yeah, let's stay tuned on that one. And then we're working on getting Jeremiah Hall on in these next few weeks. He's out in Denver training for the senior bowl for the combine for all that stuff so we'll get jeremiah on here in the next couple weeks and then uh, a guy that had a big week he will uh, he'll join us here in a couple weeks future or i guess current he's in the class so he he is now hall of famer college football hall of famer roy williams will join us january 19th i believe is what we've got roy scheduled for it's interesting (laughs) I don't know why, but for some reason, I thought he was already in. I don't know why I felt like it had already happened for some reason. I don't know. Maybe it's because Bob went in. I I don't know. So whenever he was announced, I was like, oh, I thought he already made it, but well-deserved. Let, let, let's just start there. Let's start there. I was going to start with the J.R. Sandlin stuff, but let's let's start with Roy Williams. How was he not in the college football Hall of Fame already? Like, okay, for those of you that don't know Superman, a lot of people uh, refer to him as Superman, obviously. Everyone remembers that play, Teddy. That is a play that has changed your life. There's no doubt. Uh, I'm sure everyone that sees you brings that play up, including every time I see you, basically. But he was named to the College Football Hall of Fame's 2022 class. And my reaction was, Oh yeah. I forgot that I should still be complaining about this. Like this is ridiculous that he hasn't been in. It's about damn time dead. Yeah. So I remember 
whenever like the whole thing started coming up about him going, it's been a couple years, but I think I remember him saying that the, your university has to initiate the process for you. It's not just like, it's not like they just kind of go down the list and bring it up themselves. I think like the university has to initiate or maybe put you, put you in the running for it. I don't, I don't remember exactly how it works, but he's an absolute no brainer. Um, hundred percent. There's, there's, there's no reason that, uh, you know, he would have to wait. I don't know how long he's been on the ballot, but the dude is one of the best college football players of all time. There's zero doubt about that. Yeah. So everyone remembers him for the Superman play against Texas. Of course, like everyone knows that play. It's one of the most famous plays in college football history, honestly. But you also got to remember this guy, he was a key piece to that national championship winning defense in 2000. He was a big 12 defensive player of the year consensus first team all American. He won the Thorpe award. He won the Nagurski award. He was the eighth pick of the 2002 draft. Like a safety was the eighth pick of the draft. And remember football wasn't what it is now back then, like a safety going that early. I, I, I would have to go back and look at some of the things, but if my memory serves me correctly, that wasn't exactly normal at the time. Right. Yeah. So ended up having a great pro career, five-time pro bowler there with Dallas and all these things. But the, the reason I know he was just like a different dude is from the stories like that you tell into the guys and the, the stories that the guys on that coaching staff tell about him where you're just like, okay, he was just, he was on a team with a lot of good players and he just completely separated himself even among that group. Yeah, it was unreal. From the first time I stepped on campus, and it went to my very first like summer seven on seven where it's just the players. I remember being like, how, how does he make every play? Like in seven on seven, the balls rarely like batted down or, or, or touched. It's usually pretty clean. And I think all summer I got my hand on like one pass and in practice, he'd have like every day he'd have like an interception, three pass breakups, just insane. And he's got, you know, there, there's, there's like a really fine balance for football players. Like you have to know what you're doing, like at a very high level, you have to be able to understand the defense, understand how offenses are attacking you. And on the other side, you've got to have instinct and there's got to be a balance between doing my job and making the play on the football or the ball carrier, right? So there's always like a balance, a push and pull between just doing your job or making a play. And Roy is the best I've ever seen at knowing how and when to go outside the framework of a defense and, and just make a play. It's, it's unbelievable. His instincts are just second to none. Okay, so you brought up like not remembering the nomination process or whatever. Uh, someone that remembers it is, is me because I have a reference point because the National Football Foundation once sent me a, uh, a direct message on Twitter after I complained about you not being <laughs> in the College Football Hall of Fame yet. And <laughs> they said, we just saw your tweet regarding our Hall of Fame class and hope to vote provide you with some clarity nominees must be, must be nominated by their respective collegiate institutions the nff does not pick the inductees from a random pool we certainly understand that this process and the results will never make everyone happy but we truly think that our <laughs> process for induction is one of the most thorough yeah so that is you knew that is where this was going ted because now that roy williams <laughs> is in i am making it my life's work that you uh, and Jason White get put in the College Football Hall of Fame. How is Jason White not it? I like. It, I, it what the should hell? be like is whenever they announce your name for the Heisman Trophy in New York, it should be like an instant induction into the College Football Hall of Fame. Like you're there. It's already happened. There doesn't have to be voting. There doesn't have to be anything. We we've talked about that, and 
maybe some people think we're joking, but I mean, we're dead serious. If you win the Heisman trophy, once you've been, cause I believe the rules, you, you gotta be out of college football. It's gotta be 10 years since your last game in college. Like once that 10 year market, like you cannot tell the story of college football. You cannot tell the history of college football without starting with who won the national championship and who won the Heisman trophy of each year. Every right. Heisman trophy winner should be in the college football hall of fame. It's that simple. I guess, unless you do some like really bad stuff as a human being or right after you get out of college, like, okay, maybe, maybe things change then. But the fact that Jason white isn't in with everything he accomplished in college is absurd. And I know you get mad at me when I bring it up, but the fact that you're not in is bullshit. Like it makes no sense. Well, here's the thing. Uh, Jason White definitely should be in whenever you're a, it's just like a coach. If you win a national championship, you're going to the college football hall of fame. It's, it's almost a guarantee should be the same with the Heisman trophy. Um, I don't know. It's I'm guessing it's a matter of time before uh, I would be shocked if OU hasn't nominated Jason White, right? I mean, you would think that that wouldn't slip through the cracks, but I don't know. Maybe so. Uh, maybe you can only do one person at a time. Like, I don't, we, we need more details we need, because the guy won the Heisman Trophy and then almost won it again. How? Right. It makes no sense. Like, I know we didn't, he didn't have a pro career. Like, okay, that's fine. It's not the Pro Football Hall of Fame. It's the College Football Hall of Fame. And there are very few people that have accomplished what he accomplished. So I. Well, I don't know that there's anyone that's accomplished what he's accomplished. Has anyone was, won the Heisman Trophy after a total reconstruction of their knee on both knees? Uh, we'll get the research department on that and <laughs> I'll get back to you. I have no idea. I got, I don't, I got no clue. But yeah, I. It's just some of these things, it's just dumb. Okay, let us update on OU staff. OU hired J.R. Sandlin as its new director of player personnel and recruiting. What do we know about this guy? What do you know? What, what, what have people told you? I haven't, I haven't heard anything specifically. Um, I know that he's he's been heavily involved in the recruiting aspect of some some really big places. Uh, obviously, at Alabama, there's there's a uh, you know, obviously he's a piece of what went on there to kind of get it going. Uh, one new a uh, couple of national championships there. Uh, spent a little bit of time at Tennessee. Um, I other than that, I don't know a heck of a lot, but it's kind of it's you know these these back office guys you don't hear nearly as much about floating around out there but if if venables is i i know because one of the things that he always says is how prepared he is for this job right like he's been waiting for a long time and he's prepared to for this job and to me the biggest part of the preparation and being able to make the step and make the jump is knowing that you can put the right people around you. And that's why whenever I look at all these hires and it's people maybe that I don't know a whole heck of a lot about, I know that Venables is not taking any of these hires lightly. And anyone that gets, gets a job in this staff is very well qualified. So I'm, I'm kind of, when it comes to the, the recruiting stuff and the player personnel, I'm just going to have to, kind of trust the process on this one. I don't know a whole lot about Sandlin, but my guess is there's a reason Venables targeted him specifically. Yeah, so Sandlin has spent the last eight years, I believe, coaching at Jacksonville State. He was also their recruiting coordinator. And some people may hear Jacksonville State and go, Florida? No, Jacksonville State is in the state of Alabama. So right in the heart of SEC country, he was, you mentioned, he was the director of recruiting at Tennessee. He was part of Alabama's recruiting staff for three seasons. In those three seasons, they won two natties, and they had the number one recruiting class in the country twice. And then 2013, he was a recruiting analyst at Notre Dame. So he's been some really 
good places, right? And clearly has had some success. I don't know, really know how he ended up at Jacksonville State or why he was there for so long. If he was so good at the recruiting thing, I don't know the answer to that. But he is kind of a Twitter star, man. I, I mean, he's got he's got like these inspirational sayings. He hashtags them with like morning juice. I was like, okay, Sandlin, I can get on board with that. He's got like ninety seven thousand followers on Twitter, and this feels. Ted, you and I, we, we had the pleasure of having a long conversation with this man at the Alamo Bowl in the hospitality suite. This feels like it's got Thad Turnip Seed written all over it. <laughs> it does. And, you know, whenever you think about the hire, it's really, it, it's kind of perfect. He spent a lot of time, number one, in deep SEC territory, right? Um in the recruiting aspect, which means knows all the high schools, has relationships with all of the coaches in those areas. And he's seen it from two different perspectives. He's seen it from the Alabama perspective, which is we can go get any recruit that we really want. It's more on our end. It's about um, like picking the right talent for our scholarship allocation. And then he's worked it from Jacksonville State which is in the same area trying to dig through all the crumbs and, and all of the turnover, all the rocks and, and try and find those players that slip through the cracks and knowing where to find the players that slip through the cracks and having the relationships with some of the coaches out there to trust that say, Hey, I know this kid right now may not look the part, but a year or two of development, he's going to turn into a really good football player. It's kind of the best of both worlds there because you know, Oklahoma's not going to be competing with Jacksonville State for recruits whenever they go to the SEC. I'm not saying that, but it could be difficult to just go in on everyone that Alabama and Georgia offer and be able to to have the, the same seat at the table as them. You may be turning over some rocks trying to find some kids in those areas. Yeah, and the thing, just because you know, I kind of found the videos I could find, of Sandlin and, you know, talking, whether about recruiting strategy, talking about football, whatever his vibe, it's just, it's very positive and it's like very motivational. It, it seems to, there seems to be kind of that theme developing on the defensive side of the ball, right. With the guys that Brent Venables has accumulated, right. They, they all seem to have this, they're like ultra positive. Now uh, I'm sure that when it's time to work, <laughs> on the field that th those guys will absolutely get after those kids, but it, it does seem to, to be developing kind of like that mentality and we'll, we'll see how it ends up working out, but that it seems like this, this is not like a technical term or anything, but it seems like Sandlin's vibe really goes with what Venables is trying to build at Oklahoma that, or at least that's kind of my read on the situation. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, it's going to take a, it, it, it takes a certain person. Like, I, I think it's interesting with turnip speed and, you know, Sandlin spent time at Alabama recruiting. There is a, both a vision of where we need to be and where we are now and trying to bridge the gap between the two. You can't, you don't just flip the switch and have like a massive recruiting department and start knocking out number one classes in the country. It it's a process and there's a lot that goes into it. There's, there's more money, there's more resources dedicated to it now than there's ever been in college football. So it's really competitive. Yeah. And if our, if our conversation with Thad at the Alamo bowl is any indication, they fully intend on spending a lot of money and building the recruiting department out. Yeah. And it's going to happen. Um, and my guess is sooner rather than later. That's, that's sure what it sounded like, man. That's, that's definitely <laughs> what it sounded like. All right. Let's talk a little about a uh, little bit about the roster, but first the only place to stop when you're road tripping is loves travel stops. Loves has over 560 locations in 41 states, offering 24-hour access to clean and safe places. Look at Ted with his Loves cup. That huh? a baby. Yeah. That a baby. Whatever your road trip needs are, Loves has it. Fuel, fresh food, all the snacks and drinks, including my favorite, Java 
Amore. That coffee is fantastic. Love's also has you covered if you forget your phone charger or headphones. They've expanded their mobile to go zone so you can grab any of that stuff there. Make sure you download the Love's Connect app for exclusive offers from today's most popular brands. The Love's Connect app also includes a route planner and store locator. When you see the red neon heart on the highway, stop in and say hi at Love's Travel Stops. For a full list of what Love's has to offer, visit loves.com. Opolis Clothing has the coolest OU shirts. Their shirts look great. They're buttery soft, and they last forever. By the way. Their shirts are the best. Yes. People, people keep laughing and telling me how funny they think it is when you say buttery soft. I don't know why. <laughs> uh, maybe that should be our first uh, uh, Opolis shirt if we do some, uh, some, some merch, buttery soft. Oh, yeah. Um, they also have great OKC Thunder gear. Go to opolisclothing.com, that's O-P-O-L-I-S clothing.com, and use promo code TED, T-E-D, for 15% off your entire order. That's opolisclothing.com, and use the promo code TED for 15% off. Okay, and you you mentioned Opolis does want to develop some podcast-specific merch, so send us ideas tweet at us tweet at the podcast at okay underscore breakdown tweet at me at gabe eicher tweet at ted at ted layman 11 give us your shirt ideas your sweatshirt ideas and then we're going to work with opolis to get you guys uh, some stuff that you can purchase which will be fun it will be fun but be we awesome. need your help people we need your help help us out all right roster stuff for the sooners Braden willis our, our, our podcast colleague, Braden Willis, announced that he's coming back for another season on his podcast with Jeremiah Hall. I think this was a no-brainer of a decision. Uh, I, I really do. When you look at it, and I, I went and, and looked at his stats just to make sure I wasn't crazy. The dude just has not played a ton of football the last two seasons. And some people are like, oh, well, he's done some good stuff. Why isn't he going pro? He's only played in 11 games in the last two years. So yeah. I think I think his first goal, like first and foremost, is to show that he can stay healthy for a full season. Like come back and stay healthy for an entire season because this, this is a guy that he's got all the athleticism in the world. Big, strong, one of the best looking guy guys on that team. But he's just battled injuries and yeah. only had 15 catches this season but he he does he's got that frame he's got the athleticism you're looking for at that tight end position but i think his hope is that he can come back stay healthy and be way more productive as a pass kit catcher next season continue to do the dirty stuff he's been doing right all the dirty work you know blocking on split zone blocking at the point of attack you know picking up things in pass protection like doing all the stuff that he's done but with Stogner transferring and Jeremiah Hall going to the NFL, I know they've got Daniel Parker, which is a guy that Joe John was with at Missouri. He's transferring in. They've got Jason Llewellyn and Caden Helms coming in as freshmen. But, I mean, he's going to be the veteran guy in that room. It's going to be fun to see if he can, if he can carve out a bigger role in this offense. Well, it's a perfect opportunity for him. Uh, I, you know, you, you mentioned the athleticism, the size and everything. He's got all the tools to, to put it all together. Now, you know, one of the things is uh, how, how much is Levy going to use a tight end in the passing game in his system? And I think it will really depend on what he feels the talent level at that position is right. Any good offensive coordinator is, you know, not just going to force a bunch of guys into their system. They're going to mold their system around the talent that they have, right? And try and highlight some of those best assets. So if Brain Willis can put in some really good work in the offseason, get his body right to where he's totally healthy and able to make a really good run for his senior year, you know, get in, understand this system, be a leader on the football team. Like He's going to be... Uh, probably the most veteran player on the entire offense, right? By probably by far. So 
um, you know, he needs to, he needs to kind of be that guy and, and, you know, take a, a big time leadership role, which he already has, but like uh, take some real ownership on what this football team looks like and how it behaves on and off the field. So I think it could be a big year for Braden Wills. I'm, I was thrilled that he's coming back. I, I really love the guy. I think he's awesome. Yeah, I, I know you you are high on him heading in the next season, but he he's got to take a step, right? He, he's got to take a step as a player now. Of course, staying healthy should be the number one goal for him. And, and part of that is what you're doing in the offseason, how you're preparing your body, all of those things. But if if he can take that step, and I think the staff expects him to take that step, that would be really, really crucial for this offense next season with, with all the new additions, you know, with everything, having a veteran guy that, that can produce at a tight end position. It just makes, it makes offense easier. It just does. So yep. let's hope, let's hope he's, he, he's got the skill set. just got to put it all together. Right. And I, I think that's what we're all hoping for that those flashes we've seen from him over the last two seasons, that he just puts it all together and we get a full healthy season of the best version of Braden Willis. Yep. That's, that's what I'm looking for. That's uh, you know, he, he has all of the ability in the world. I think he's got the right mindset as a football player as well. It's all about putting all those pieces together. Yeah. All right. We knew Jaron Canick. Are we still going with Canick? I, I guess that's what I'm going with until I hear otherwise. Uh, uh, correct us if we're wrong. People <laughs> tend to uh, enjoy doing that. I guess I guess people think we're terrible at pronouncing names. I swear we try our best. I really, I, I think we really it's do. Good. This is all your fault with what you do on your local show. Ted. This is all your <laughs> fault. But Jaron Canick, we all knew he was enrolled at OU, right? That That cat got out of the bag when people found him in the student database. But he is officially committed. Stud linebacker out of the state of Kansas, number one player out of the state of Kansas. And, man, you know it's not official until a guy puts out a cool graphic saying he's coming, Ted. That's that's what the kids do so, these days. It's uh, it, how good is your graphic game, I guess. But I don't know. I thought it was cool. And he, he kind of talked about the process and said that Venables told him no uh, to go to Clemson. And, you know, he he wasn't going to – you know, do anything with him until uh, Davo signed off on it. And he did. So that's why you're seeing him here at Oklahoma right now. And uh, which I, you know, I think is, is the right way to do it. If you're Brent Venables and um, you still end up, you, you did it the right way, risk not getting a, a player that you really think highly of, but it turns out uh, in the long run, you did it the right way. Cause you got the kid too. And the uh, sky's the limit with this kid. Um, uh, good size high school backer that can absolutely fly has tons of athleticism uh maybe be a wildcat quarterback i don't know if you've seen any of the uh of the highlights of him just snap it to him and let him go uh, pretty I've, I've, wild. Seen the, I've seen that one highlight that everyone circulates on twitter where he just like runs through like eight people's soul i'm like oh my god now I, i'm not gonna pretend that kansas high school football is like the greatest level of high school football but I've known some pretty damn good players coming out of the state of Kansas. So I, it's like a real life version of Bo Jackson on the old Tecmo bowl running through people is what it really looks like. It's hilarious. Yeah. That, that clip is just absurd. The one thing he, he had a conversation with our buddy, Josh McQuistion. And the one thing that he said about Venables, he's just like, man, integrity, like that guy's got. And I, I know some people, think that this situation was like, okay, did Venables really do this stuff? Well, the young man, Canick, just told you exactly how he went about doing it. And people see that stuff. Like, I know some people may see that and be like, okay, what does that really matter? Like, he didn't go after a Clemson guy. Like, is it that big of a deal? Like, when, when a coach does things the right way and, you know, sticks to his word, all that stuff, and, like, shows loyalty the way that Brent Venables has – to Clemson in this process and just does it the right way, right? Where, where it feels right. It doesn't feel <laughs> dirty or anything like that. That spreads like recruits talk about that stuff. And I, I think, yeah, you, you, you end up 
doing it the right way if you're BV. You end up getting Canik, but also now everyone knows you went about it that way, and that's a good thing in my opinion. Like people know how BV operates, and he already had an incredible reputation as a recruiter. But now you add this on to be like, hey, he's also a, a stand-up guy. Like he, he goes about it the way you should go about it. That's that's only help helping Oklahoma in the long run, in my opinion. Well, there's no doubt about it. Now I know this is a Kansas kid, and you know his high school is not going to be spitting out four and five star players every single year. But I, high school coaches see that too, and you know, whenever you treat guys properly and the coach and the family understand that and understand like how good you were with the process, uh, that's where people start suggesting you go high school coaches that do have a bunch of talent come through and you treat the, the recruiting process with integrity. Like you're talking about that's, that's whenever it starts to pay dividends because high school coaches you know, want to help you get good players in whenever they, they know that they're going to be treated well. Yeah. Uh, another thing on the recruiting trail, Sooners got a commitment from Jonah Laulu, which awesome name. Can't wait. 6'6", 280 pounds, defense alignment, started the last two seasons at Hawaii. And after seeing all the reports about Todd Graham, I – can understand why he wanted to get the hell out of that program oh my gosh but Todd Graham whoo yeah rough rough weekend for Todd Graham I I doubt that he, we're going to bring him up in uh winners and losers of the weekend but that dude could be a loser of the weekend my good whoo no doubt. if you if you haven't read about any of that go uh go check it out but Sooners get La Ulu over Georgia over USC over LSU over Miami, I think it's safe to say this is Miguel Chavis's first recruiting win, right? Yeah, yeah, I think so. Um, that's big time. I don't know how often we're getting players over the schools that you just mentioned. That's essentially the who's who out there of, of big time defensive line recruiting. Right. To be able to pull a defensive lineman from that group is, is huge. Um, and, you know, getting the, the, the connection to, there's a lot of athletes that come from Hawaii per capita and, you know, to, to have a connection out there is, is big time. You've now got a quarterback defensive lineman. And like, if, if you can build a pipeline, cause it, that's, it's really relationship oriented recruiting Hawaii. So, um, that's a couple of really positive uh, things there. Everyone knows that Norman, Oklahoma is the Maui of the Midwest. Like every, that's, that's what everyone says. Basically. Yeah. Yeah. Or the Can Southwest. What, the what region are we even in? That is, that's obvious. That that's what it's, are we Southwest? Are we Midwest? Are we in between? We're South Midwest, I guess. So Norman is, is the Maui of the South Midwest, even though I think, this kid's from Las Vegas, but he's clearly he's got right. roots in Hawaii, went to Hawaii, but, and a, a bunch of the big schools are in Honolulu, which is on Oahu. It's not even on Maui. So now I'm just in a spiral of, <laughs> I don't know why I'm explaining Hawaiian geography right now, but here we are. But yes, the Hawaiian connection, I'm all for it. Bring, bring me all the Tongans, all the Samoans. I want the defensive tackles to don't wear wrist tape. Bring them all, Ted, let's roll. <laughs> no, I, I, I think it's, I think it's big and to get some big size like that on the edge, six, six, two eighty. Um, if, I mean, if, if that's legit, cause the pictures I've seen, he looks like a, he'd be a very trim looking 280 pounds. So that's going to be really impressive. And you get a guy that's done it is somewhat uh, prepared for big boy college football. You know, he's been playing in, in a, in a, uh, in a D one program. So, we're trying to fill a gap there on the defensive line with all of the lost production. So it'll be big to have him in. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I'm excited to see what the kids got in spring ball. So that, that'll be to be fun to see him. Some of those spring practices. All right. Caleb Williams update. Not much of an update. I, I think you and I are both kind of on the same page here where it's just like, yeah, yeah, really just not expecting him back at Oklahoma, but 
I will say this. I know Ole Miss has put together a substantial package for him. And I'm talking substantial. So I, I still think he ends up at USC and maybe him and his family, maybe they are leveraging Ole Miss to get more from USC. I don't, I don't know, but it just, it doesn't feel like he's coming back to OU, right? Like I, I think, I don't want to tell people to have hope when I don't think there is any. Yeah. I don't, uh, can, could you imagine if he goes to Ole Miss? Like, that would just be. Great jerseys. Uh, great jerseys. Good looking unis. But I, I wouldn't even, I, I, I honestly wouldn't even know how to feel about that because if you're going to. If you're going to Ole Miss, the reason you're going there would be, like, if it's not money, uh, supposedly would be for like development and and their offense. But Lane Kiffin doesn't run their offense. Like he, I, I don't. It's just so like anti anything that you would think. I it's it's crazy, but it's real. Yeah, we'll see. We'll see where he ends up. I'm I'm convinced he's ending up at USC, but who knows? Maybe he ends up somewhere. It makes random. the most sense. It makes USC, the most yeah. sense. It, it makes the most sense. But I, I will say, and you, you called it, it does, it does feel like there has been quite the shift from the fan base on this. And I seems like we're dealing Gabriel people now. <laughs> like that was quick. But it's how it works. It, I mean, it's how it works. It's just that's how the sport works. That's the thing. It's how college football is, and uh, like I, that's why to me the NIL stuff make, doesn't make a whole heck of a lot of sense because the college football fans are going to be a fans of their university. It's built in. They know you're only going to be here for a very limited amount of time. No one is tying themselves with you. They'll move on from you in an instant to the next guy. Like Dylan Gabriel is going to be the guy selling the jerseys now. He's going to be the guy that everyone's freaking out whenever he's, you know, on campus or whatever. It's quick. You know, it, you, the, the turnaround is very fast. Move, move on quickly. Yeah, I, I'll say this. Dylan Gabriel has a business manager. That business manager has been contacted. Dylan Gabriel is very interested in coming on this podcast. Just has to talk to the coaches about it first. So contact has yeah. been made. The effort has been made, Ted. So we're, nice. we're, uh, we're trying to get the newest quarterback for the Oklahoma Sooners on here. I, I want the fan base to be able to, you know, hear from the guy, right? Yeah. Give them what they want. They want to hear from the new quarterback, man. Yeah. So if all of you that listen out there, tweet Dylan Gabriel, tell him to come on the pod. Let's roll. Uh, one other QB note, Chubba Purdy, right? Got, got an offer uh, going to visit this week. I'm not going to lie. I don't know a ton about Chubba Purdy other than he's a highly recruited kid and he's Brock Purdy's brother. But I do know that Oklahoma needs quarterback depth, right? You, you need to add another guy for sure. I know you got Evers coming, which, which we're all excited about uh, because Levy was able to make him flip and and add him late in the recruiting process, but you can't have too many quarterbacks. That's my whole mentality. If Chubba Purdy is a guy that wants to be a Sooner, maybe he pushes Dylan Gabriel for the job. I don't know, but sure, right? I, Brock was pretty decent. Uh, hopefully, he doesn't turn the ball over in big situations like his brother. Whew, in some loud turnovers, some just really comical, loud. No, just comical ways. <laughs> That spike, uh, yeah. That spike in the cheese and pull still cracks me up. Oh, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. You're, you've got to have depth at quarterback. You know that's that's one of the things, man. And we we've, we've been really blessed to have a lot of times the two best quarterbacks in the conference and two of the best quarterbacks in the country oftentimes on the same roster at the same exact time. It's, you know, it's one of those things that we've really been blessed with. And some years you got to use it. Most you don't, but 
you never know, man. You're you're always a play away from being on number two for the rest of the year. So, yeah, you've got to have some good depth in that in that quarterback room, and there's got to be some type of competition there. You know, um, I think that's good for everyone involved if if, if players are pu- pushing each other. Yep, no doubt. All right, let's get to call your shot, and we ask you guys the most important thing that happened this week for OU football, and there was a general consensus. Um, Ted and this, this one response from Carter J at Carter J 1982 on Twitter, I think sums up the majority of responses. He said easily the hiring of Todd Bates. Look at the 23 recruits that immediately are giving us a look. Don't mean to downplay Caleb gate, but Gabriel knows levy system and we will be fine for one more year in the big 12. The Todd Bates thing like all the four star and five star defensive linemen and you and I we don't we don't really dive into the recruiting world like that but I know that's good. I hadn't seen that before. I know that a bunch of big time defensive line recruits tweeting at the program's Twitter handle. Hadn't seen that ever and it was like in a giant wave. I love how our man Carter J had 23. I'm going to take 23. I'm going to take his word for it. That's the number he threw out there. I don't feel like it was random. So perfect. It's a lot. Sounds like as, as good of a, a source as any that I've ever heard in recruiting. So, yeah, and I I think it's huge and was laughing about the fact that you had this, this type of hire and it has all been overshadowed. Not that many people have talked about it, but uh, it's a big deal. And it's not just recruiting. He is an excellent recruiter. He's done some really good things there, but – he develops talent well uh, also. He's taken good talent in the recruiting game and turned them into NFL football players. That's that's what you have to have. It's not just recruiting. You have to get the good talent in. There's no doubt. But once it's on campus, you've got to develop it. And he's really the best of both worlds. Yeah. Um, I, I'm trying not to get too excited about the defensive side of the ball, but it's kind of hard not to. And – I know they lost their four best players on defense, but like this new staff, man, new attitude, Schmitty being back. We've got 280 pound Hawaiian dudes now, like played the end. I don't know. I'm a little fired up. Season's kind of a far ways off, but who cares? It's it, well, the good thing is I have a feeling it's going to continue. Like it's, it's been a steady stream, steady drip of news coming out and, uh, I think the stuff's going to keep happening. I think there's going to be more transfer portal stuff, um, you know, on, on both sides, probably leaving and coming in. Uh, it's, it's good times right now. Yeah. I'm also excited about birthday shout outs. Happy fourth birthday to Sophia Noakes. That's right. Right. Noakes N O K E S Noakes gotta be. That's right. You nailed it. Happy birthday, Sophia. Happy sixth birthday to Hudson Holt. Oh, a little alliteration in your life. Hudson Holt. All right. Happy birthday, Hudson. Happy 21st birthday to Kalen McKinney. Ooh, happy birthday, Kalen. Be smart. Be smart. Don't no bad decisions. No bad decisions there, Kalen. You you got it. Happy 21st. Happy 60th birthday to Guy Walcott. Oh, what a guy guy is. 60. How about that? We got the opposite end of the spectrum there. 21 and 60. How about that? Happy birthday, Guy. Happy belated 68th birthday to Dr. Dave Hatfield, which is Dr. Dave. I mean, that's an incredible name. Happy birthday, Doc. Happy birthday to Megan and Solomon Septum. Happy birthday, Megan and Solomon. Happy 15th. You didn't know what to do with that one. You're like, ah, I well, got I'm nothing. trying to think. I get, is that twins? Huh. I, I think it was like a mother daughter. If I remember correct. Okay. Or t- no, mother, t- some, they're, they're related. They're related. Okay. Huh? It was, I was just, I was, it, I was if they give me the year, if they give me the year, I put it in there. And if they don't, like, if they just say, hey, happy birthday to them, and then I just, I'm like, all right, I'm moving on. Happy birthday. The Septums. Happy 15th anniversary 
to Stacy and Rich Lubers. Uh, we'll the be Lubers, the only lube. Happy anniversary. <laughs> Wait, what? <laughs> anniversary with the Lubers. <laughs> There's a lot of jokes to be had there. A lot of jokes, Lubers. Congrats to uh. the Teague family on the birth of Walker Michael Teague. And shout out to Zach Whittle. Sounds like our man Zach was super dad when the wife had COVID. Good job, Zach. Wow. How about that? Way to be there. Giving all those husbands a good name. All right. Let's move on to the National College Football Roundup. But first, do you own a business if you do? You need Insurica in your life. Insurica is, the, is one of the country's largest insurance brokers with 30 offices throughout Oklahoma, Texas, and the Southwest. Insurica is able to customize programs by accessing the latest information from many insurance carriers. They compare and contrast coverage offerings and pricing in order to design a cost-effective, comprehensive program to meet your business's specific needs. Insurica's clients become best-in-class businesses by working with Insurica's team of advisors to manage risk. Purchasing insurance is only one way to protect your business. Best-in-class businesses win by avoiding a loss in the first place. If your business partners with Insurica, you'll save huge amounts of money and take back control of your total cost of risk. I'm an Insurica client, and you should be too. If your business wants to be best in class, connect with Insurica at Insurica.com. That's I-N-S-U-R-I-C-A.com. Guys, winter is here, but does the weather matter? Because it's always hard seltzer season, and there's only one hard seltzer that we drink on this podcast, and that is Sonic Hard Seltzer from Coupel Works. It's perfect for any occasion. We drink it in the hot tub, by the fire, and at the tailgate. You can buy 12 packs the iconic Sonic drive-in flavors like Cherry Limeade and Ocean Water, where you can grab a citrus variety pack or a tropical variety pack. Find it at your local grocery convenience and liquor stores. I had me a seltzer Saturday. It was great. It was fantastic. What'd you go with? Cherry I, Limeade? I, I'm really liking the like classic Limeade ones, man. They're just, they go down real easy. I'm I talking like a, a little too real easy, though. All right. QB Carousel continues to spin in college football. Casey Thompson is headed to Nebraska. Excited for Casey. Uh, will be interesting to see what he can do there uh, with the new offense coordinator, Mark Whipple, who's coming from Pitt. We, we mentioned how that was, was probably a strong selling point for Scott Frost in Nebraska that Whipple was coming on, on board after what he did with Kenny Pickett this season. Man, I hope Casey Thompson plays really, really well in every game but one next year. Because you got to remember the Sooners are going up to Lincoln. So we'll see if they get some weapons around him via the portal. Uh, that's That's been their big issue, but who knows? But I, I'm i excited he's got an opportunity because I, I do think – I think he's a good player. Uh, I really do. So um, I'm hoping he succeeds there at Nebraska except for – when he plays OU. Yeah. He's, he's got a lot of talent. Uh, he's got some nice size to him. He's athletic. He can beat you with his legs. Uh, I wouldn't say that he's a, a great runner, but he's, he's more than adequate. Um, and you know, he can, he can throw the deep ball. Well, he's accurate underneath seems to be a smart kid. So yeah, I think it's, it's, it's gotta be, one of the best quarterbacks, like just talent wise that they've had at Nebraska in a long time. Um, I, so yeah, if, if obviously you saw the, the development, um, there with the Pitts offense under, under Whipple. So yeah, I, I think it's a, I think it's a great thing for both. I think it could be really good for Casey Thompson. And I think it could be really good for Nebraska. Yeah. I, I think some people thought that Casey might, embrace battling Dylan Gabriel for the job at OU and come along, but that didn't make much sense for, for either party in my mind. I, I think he wants to go somewhere where he can, he can get on the field and be the starter. And I, I I'm not going to pretend I know what Nebraska has when it comes to that quarterback room, but it'll be interesting to see. Uh, I would expect him to be the starter for them next season, but yeah, best of luck to Casey Thompson. He, I, I've known him since he was a little kid, and I just I, – I like the way he goes about his business. I do. It just just works. It kind of keeps his head down. So I hope that – I hope it works out for him. Okay, 
former Texas A&M quarterback Zach Calzada is headed to Auburn. So goes from one SEC West school to another, which is pretty interesting. Remember, Max Johnson is going from LSU to become the new quarterback at Texas A&M. So that's why Zach Calzada left. Now Calzada headed to Auburn. We'll, we'll see if he ends up being the guy there for Brian Harson, Ted, but we little SEC West movement. And, oh, I love when this happens. You're muted, and everyone ah. on YouTube is going to know you're an idiot. Amazing. Um, this is just so funny to me. Like, Calzada is going to Auburn because Auburn's quarterback left for Oregon it's just it's unbelievable man that this many quarterbacks every year are starting to rotate it's it's crazy that's why that's why we got to keep the people updated on the QB carousel of college football like it is kind of confusing if you're if you're not keeping a flow chart at home man you're it's tough yeah you I I don't expect everyone every year whenever the the balls finally kicked off and late August, early September that you, you know, the team that's come to town, it's like, Oh, I didn't know that Thompson's now at Nebraska. You know, there's, it's hard to keep track of all of it. Shocking. And and remember Thompson at Nebraska because Quinn Ewers left Ohio state without ever playing and will now be a Texas and everyone assumes he's just going to play. So yeah, well, just, and because Adrian Martinez left Nebraska to go to Kansas state, of course, which everyone now knows is, Girlfriend plays soccer at Kansas State. So that's it. Everyone's like, oh, great get for Kansas State. Like, huh. The the girlfriends are the best recruiters, man. There's no doubt. That's right. Uh, former Missouri quarterback. Let's just keep this thing rolling, shall we? Former Missouri quarterback, Connor Basilak, headed to Indiana. And remember, opening at Indiana. Now he's going to have to compete for that job. They're just not going to hand it to him. But that's because Michael Penix Jr. went to Washington. So that that's, there was a void. Basilak thinks he's uh, filling the void. Who goes to Missouri? All right. Don't be, don't be a good young quarterback and kill the, the, the chain here. This needs to go on forever. Okay. So someone's got to transfer to Missouri. Maybe it'll be Keaton Slovis. Has he landed somewhere yet? I don't think so. I don't remember seeing anything. I don't think so. Did I see that the other kid is in the portal now too? What was the um, the freshman? Jackson Dart is he portaled? I I don't. I shouldn't have, shouldn't have even brought that up. I thought that I saw that somewhere, but I don't know. It's it's more that I'm going to be disappointed with myself than anything because I've really tried to stay on top of the carousel. So let's see. Googling. Yeah. I don't see anything off the top. Okay. Oh, nope. Nope. Keen Slovis. That's four weeks ago. I don't see anything off the top. This is great podcasting, by the way. I, <laughs> I don't see anything as far as Jackson dart being in the portal, but I guarantee you the second that Caleb okay, Williams good. is coming, he's going to be in it. And maybe he'll be the next quarterback yep. in Missouri. Who knows? Okay. A couple other things I want to talk about Gary Patterson. And I, I think this, this does pertain to Oklahoma football fans, which is why I think it's important we talk about it. Gary Patterson was reportedly in Austin this week meeting with Steve Sarkeesian and Texas's coaching staff. He toured the facilities and there was some sort of discussion about a possible role for him on Texas's staff. And, and the reports say the meetings went well. And there are some people that expect him to join that staff in some capacity. And you can say whatever you want about Gary Patterson, right? The last four seasons at TCU have been disappointing. That's why he's not the coach there anymore. But I will tell you this. The offensive coaches that I've been around for Oklahoma these last several years, they talk about Gary Patterson and that system differently than any other group in the big 12, they have an incredible amount of respect for Gary Patterson. And a bunch of those offense coaches are still around at Oklahoma. And I'll say, I don't want him on Texas's staff. 
in any capacity. I don't want it because even though the results haven't been great, he has been tremendous at developing players. He is one of the brightest defensive minds in all of college football. People come through Fort Worth every year studying coverages that he invented. I don't want Texas to be better, and Texas will be better if Gary Patterson is on that staff in any capacity, analyst, whatever, assistant to the head coach, whatever. Don't do it, Gary. Don't do it. Yeah, it's kind of shocking. You feel like there's um... – I don't know if you're, if you're TCU and Patterson goes to, to Texas, that seems, I don't, it's not, I know it's not the rival, but I don't, I don't know. That just seems, uh, seems strange there, but you know, I, I had heard, we had, we had heard that Patterson was sniffing around, uh, the Oklahoma job to see what, what, what he could do whenever, whenever Lincoln Riley was gone. So, I mean, you're going to see this with with both Texas and Oklahoma, the additions of guys like this to their staff. We've seen it and been used to it happening at places like Alabama, right? It's it's a place where a coach that's, you know, just been let go from a job or stepped away from a job, whatever, takes some of those analyst roles. And, you know, we hadn't seen that in the Big 12 for the most part, definitely not at Oklahoma that's going to be something that, that comes up and I, it wouldn't shock me if you see Oklahoma start making hires like that as well for, for guys that are not going to have on field roles. Yeah. The, the Nick Saban coaches rehabilitation center is clearly the most popular and most successful operation when it comes to those off the field analyst roles. I mean, you saw this week, right? Bill O'Brien getting yep. an interview with the Jacks to be the head coach. I mean, he's, and he's done a great job. He's done a great job as the offense coordinator for Bama. So, I mean, yep. he, it, OU, it, and that's going to be different. And that is going to, that kind of goes back to what we talked about a little earlier about the program. They're going to be spending some money. And, you know, a lot of those coaches, they, they'll have buyouts, you know, they'll be on you know, minimal contracts, things like that, because they'll be getting paid from other places, but extra eyes, extra knowledge, just different opinions in the room, that stuff matters. And OU hasn't had that stuff recently. Like they haven't. And that is, that is something I know this new staff, is is going to work toward as the transition of the SEC, you know, kind of comes closer and closer because that's what Georgia does, that's what Alabama does, like that's what that's the SEC man. They got all these guys behind the scenes that you don't even know are on the staffs that are helping put these game plans together, and it's it's valuable. Like it, it's valuable to have those guys. And that's why I don't want Texas to have Gary Patterson as one of those guys. No, I refuse. I no. disavow no. that. <laughs> no, I'm with you. I'm with you. I don't, I don't want, uh, I don't want Patterson at Texas either. And it just, it goes back. I, I continue to think Sarkeesian's doing a really good job there. I, I'm not going to, predict that they do anything in any upcoming season, but he's made some really good moves there. It's just a, a question whether or not the donors and regents and everyone down there can stay out of his way. Yeah, we'll see. All right. And then last thing, final thoughts on the national championship game. If you haven't listened to it or watched it on YouTube, we've got an awesome preview of Alabama, Georgia with our buddy Cole Kublik on our last episode. Go check it out. You're not going to get a more detailed breakdown going into that game than what Cole Kublik gives. So go back, watch it, listen to it, and you'll learn something. But one thing I've seen this week or this weekend is people being like, ah, do I really want to watch Bama, Georgia? Like it's a rematch. Do I like, who, who cares? And I, the whole point of sports is for the two best teams to play each other for the title. Like that's the whole point. 
And that's whether you like it or not, like that's exactly what we've got in this one. And the one thing that I keep coming back to with this game is there's just going to be a stupid amount of talent on the field. Like you look at it, it is it is highly likely that the number one pick of the 2022 draft is on this is is playing in this game, and the number one pick of the 2023 draft is playing in this game. Now, that's with the Jaguars still having the number one pick. You you would think maybe they go Evan Neal, the offensive tackle from from Alabama, number one overall to protect Trevor Lawrence. Now maybe they go Thibodeau or Hutchinson. That's that's very possible for sure, but. I don't think there's any doubt that Bryce Young and Will Anderson, one of those two guys is going to be the number one overall pick in the 2023 draft. So I, I saw McShay said that 17 of his top 100 draft eligible players are playing in this game, which is just, I mean, you got to remember, this is all football players at all levels. Like they, they'll find them for wherever, right? 17 of his top hundred that are eligible for this draft. And our buddy, Dane Brugler, who we've had on before the NFL draft before, he put together a list of the top 30 draft eligible prospects in this game. And like a bunch of them are underclassmen and they can go. Some will probably come back, but it just, it's just a reminder. There's just a stupid amount of talent in this game on Monday night. And I, I know people are annoyed because it's all SEC. Like I get it, but I just don't understand why people wouldn't want to watch this game. I don't get that. Yeah. Well, I think you, I under, I guess I understand it because even though it's not, I I can get the feeling that it's, it's the same. They tired of seeing the same teams every year and everyone is the college football fans are spread so far out. It's way much, way more than any of your professional sports. So it has to be something compelling to get everyone else to watch for like just general fans, like your college football fan, like the hardcores are going to watch no matter who it is, but to have an appeal to the rest of that, that really big audience that's divided a bunch of different ways is to have a chance for like an unbelievable story, you know, like that's how you draw in more people. But as far as if you want to see the two best teams, you you've got it. And I think we knew this was going to be the matchup for the, for the two best teams for <laughs> three quarters of the college football season. Yeah. And I do think George is the better team. I really do. I, I don't think Bama is going to carve George's defense up like they did in the sec championship game. I think Mechie being out is significant. I think Georgia's defense, they're going to change up their looks. Uh, they're going to make it more difficult on Bryce Young. But I'm just not picking against Nick Saban, man. <laughs> I'm just not. And especially with them being an underdog, are you kidding me? Him being able to use that for the entire preparation of this game? Like, I'm not picking against that man. Not doing it. I'm going to need to see Kirby Smart beat Nick Saban before I can pick against him. I mean, he's the greatest of all time, and I don't even think it's a discussion. It's that simple for me. And that's where I'm at. It's like, I think George is better, but I'm, I'm, I'm picking Bama to win. It's that simple. I, I totally agree with you. Um, now, I'm not sure that I think George is the better team, but it, it, the point is, is, it's really close. And whenever it's really close, you take the best coach, you take the best quarterback and you take a team that is experienced in this game and in this type of moment and also beat this team the last time they played. Okay. So whenever you add all those together, right, you know, on the field, you know, I, I think Alabama may even have an edge there just because of the big difference in quarterback. But whenever you take all of the other circumstances that you would pick almost every single other thing in this game in Alabama's favor. Yeah. Maybe saying George is better is not the right way of saying they just, they've been the more consistent team all season yeah. long. It's like at the end of the year, there's no doubt Bama has been rolling and they whooped George's ass in the sec championship game. But if you just look at the full body of work, like, 
Georgia has been so good, except yeah. for one game. That was the one game against Bama. I realized that. But they just – I went back and watched that that Georgia-Michigan game again just because I was bored. Dude, they just – they whooped what I think we all agree is the best offensive line in all of college football. Like, they destroyed that Michigan O-line. And I was just like, oh, my God. Like, so – it, it's going to be interesting, but you mentioned the quarterback play. Does the revelation that Stetson Bennett has a flip phone, does that change how you view this game at all? It changes how I view him. That's a hero right there. <laughs> that man should be absolutely celebrated uh, in this country. College football fans of all ages. Uh, get the guy's statue outside uh, Georgia Stadium, man. That is awesome. Would would you have a flip phone if because you have to use Twitter for your local show? We use Twitter a little bit for our podcast. Would you have a flip phone if you didn't have to do that? If it wasn't for work, it's like everyone looks forward to the days of retiring. I look forward to the day where I can finally just get a flip phone. And that would be. I'd be a happy man, happy man. Ted Lehman, flip phone guy. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's finish up with our winners and losers of the weekend. But first, Ted. Uh, concussions are a part of football. They don't have to be part of your pool party. Nip the slip with soft rocks, rubber safety surfacing, and spend more time enjoying your outdoor parties and less time worrying about a slip and fall on your pool deck. Soft Rock of OKC specializes in customized slip-resistant, decorative rubber surfacing for your pool decks, patios, walkways, and gym floors. Local business owners Heidi and Cody Clark at Soft Rock of OKC are ready to help you prevent that next slip. Visit softrock.com slash OKC. That's S-O-F-T-R-O-C dot com slash OKC for more information. The Clarks also own the driveway company. The driveway company has tailored solutions to eliminate all of your driveway problems. They can repair cracks, clean and seal your rotting grass field joints to prevent water damage, ultimately saving you thousands of dollars in future repairs. Visit the driveway slash OKC for all of your driveway repair needs. Learn more about soft rock and the driveway company by visiting their Facebook and Instagram pages or by calling 405-294-9834. And make sure you send your kids to Bishop McGinnis Catholic high school. Bishop McGinnis Catholic high school has a long tradition of educational excellence with a 12 to 1 student to teacher ratio, no student is overlooked. Bishop McGinnis's college prep curriculum offers 22 AP courses. There are numerous clubs and organizations for students to join and is a proud member of the OSSAA. There are 14 sports offered. If you want to provide the best possible educational and spiritual development for your children, contact Bishop McGinnis Catholic High School or visit bmchs.org. Financial aid is available. As always, Ted, kick us off. Who do you have as your winner of the weekend? It's got to be Jim Harbaugh. To be able to lose in the semifinal the way that they did and be up for all kinds of jobs, maybe Vegas. Vegas has been sniffing around, uh, putting together uh, some type of big offer for him. Uh, if you can lose that game, turn that into a really good NFL gig, and get out of the Michigan job reputation intact has to be one of the greatest uh, accomplishments that, that we've seen. Uh, that would be huge for Jim Harbaugh. So I, I don't, I don't blame the guy right now for saying that he is wanting to get back into the NFL. You peaked man at Michigan. The semifinal is winning the big 10. That's as good as it gets. Get out now. So there's going to be, there's, there's quite a few jobs open, right? So we know the bears is going to come open. They haven't fired Nagy yet, but I expect that what Monday probably. Yeah. So it, by the time some people are listening to this, he, he's probably been fired. So you'll have Chicago open. Uh, now, Rich, Do you believe the Ryan day to Chicago stuff. I don't know. I don't know what to believe with right. like, maybe they'll hire Gruden. Gruden's, co Gruden's coming back. He, he's been canceled 
but he's resurrected now. I, I, I don't know because right as we're recording this, the Raiders are up 17, 14 with 11 42 to go in the third. Like if, what is his name? Basaccia? Like, I, I forget how you pronounce yeah. his name. Rich. He's a good coach. Uh, Rich yeah. Basaccia. He's, I was with him in Tampa. He's, he's fantastic. So if he, he kind of picked up all the pieces of that mess, if he takes that group to the playoffs, are they really not going to give him the job? Like it really? Yeah. I don't know. We've seen special teams coaches, uh, you know, turn into really good head coaches. John Harbaugh has done it there at Baltimore. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't think that, I mean, he, he's, he's given a good interview right now and the players will tell you everything kind of about that and what they, what they think of it, you know, and I'm assuming that's assuming he wants it. And I'm guessing that he would, right. Um, to be able to, to go to a, the head coach of the Raiders would be awesome, but yeah, I don't know what they do. Maybe Harbaugh will be the, the next head coach of the Giants. Did you see what they did today? No. Backed up third and nine. Third and nine. QB sneak. They ran a QB sneak on offense when it was third and nine. I am not kidding. Where were they backed up? Were they like it on was the like one? The, no. No, it was like the four. Third and nine. Oh. Interesting. Did they get it? <laughs> they did not. They did not. They did not get it. I I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. And I think Joe Judge after he's like, yeah, we wanted to get some more room for the punt on fourth down. <laughs> I was like, Joe Judge, what? It, that guy is, oh, man. But, yeah, they were playing the Washington football team. I'm looking at it right now. Four-yard line, third and nine in the second quarter, five minutes ago. Give me sneak. Like you can't even make it up. Like what? Wow. Hey, <laughs> I don't know. I don't, I've got nothing for you on that. Dude, I, I mean, I'm, I, I feel like you and I both watched a lot of football and played a lot of football. I've never seen that. <laughs> never. Okay. Who do you have no. as your well, loser? I mean, I've seen, if you're on like the one and it's like a, a, a really a dire situation in the game. I can see you trying to get more room for the punter so you can get it off and aren't worried about getting it blocked. But at that moment in the game and from the four, 14 yards is almost a, like it's like 14 to 14 and a half is a full snap for the punter. So that, that doesn't make it. It's no. Do you, do you think Jake Fromm, he was playing quarterback for him today. Do you think he heard that in his helmet? And he was like, wait, can I get that again? Can I get it again? What? I, I think I heard QB sneak. That can't be right. And they're like, no, no, no. Sneak it. Like, what? Yeah. Well, I think if, if you're the quarterback and they call in a sneak in that situation, you have to have to take that. You're getting fired as soon as the season is over. Right. They have that little trust in you. You just got to change the play, man. I mean, you can't. <laughs> Because it's all over Twitter, and that is like I can't hear it. I don't know. Hey, it's out. Get... <laughs> all right, who do you have as your loser of the weekend? You know, very rarely do you see. Well, I guess it's maybe it's more often than than we'd like to to see. But whenever people that are the best in the world at their craft, like can't get out of their own way, like the wasted talent. And I'm talking about Antonio Brown. There was a stint where Antonio Brown was the best wide receiver in the NFL. And no one really cared to, to listen to any other uh, suggestions. He was unbelievable. The, uh, the consecutive seasons that he put together there at Pittsburgh. And since then the guy cannot, get out of his own way it's been one disaster after another um lucky to get on a team for you know the next next season or the next opportunity his his eighth chance and you screw it up again it's just an endless cycle and there's just it's frustrating because there's no telling how good the guy could have been yeah it, it's definitely frustrating because you just, you know, 
seen him up close, right? We, we had a joint practice against Pittsburgh when I was in Detroit and you just watched that guy and he was barely doing anything in practice and you just watched him run routes and you're like, Oh my gosh, like guy was just different. And he, he worked extremely hard to get to that position, right? It's not like he was a highly drafted guy or anything, but yeah, it's, it's like discomforting to see how this is kind of progressing, or I guess you would say, you know, devolving, declining, whatever word you want to use for Antonio Brown, especially like now going after Tom Brady, a guy that was the only reason he was in Tampa Bay in the first place. The guy that like let you stay at his house and stuff like it. I don't know. He's doing like the little media tour. He's going on podcasts, which why the hell didn't you come on ours? Antonio Brown, what the hell? But I don't know, man. Which that, did you uh, the snippets I heard from that podcast? The, I I don't know. I've never heard that podcast before. But what a bunch of gutless losers! Whenever he was saying some of the things that that he was, and they were just like falling right in line with it. Oh yeah, you are the best ever. I, it's, it's just it was ridiculous. Yeah. No pushback on anything at all. Yeah, it was it was a little odd. Still, Antonio, if you want to come on, holler at us. We'll, we'll, we'd love to have you. Be fun. But, yeah, man, there's no way he ever gets back. He, he's done, right? He's got to be. I, I don't knows? know. I mean, he's I, good. I, but he's also yeah, getting he's, old. Yeah. I, I've i said that there's no way he plays, like, I think three or four times now. <laughs> it just keeps happening. So, I don't know. Yeah. All right, if you are a whiskey or bourbon drinker, stop what you're doing. Head to your favorite liquor store and buy some Balcones products. You got to grab some of Balcones Lineage Single Malt Whiskey. It was just voted one of the top 20 whiskeys in the world by Whiskey Advocate, and you'll be shocked by how affordable it is. Also, you got to snag some of Balcones Baby Blue Corn Whiskey. It's made from the blue corn. That's the fancy corn. And that is why it has won more than 25 awards. Last but certainly not least, you got to buy some of Balcones Pot Still Bourbon. Its big flavors make it the perfect bourbon to drink year-round. In 2012, Balcones Single Malt won the Best in Glass competition, beating brands like Johnny Walker and McAllen and became the first American distillery to win the competition. This stuff is the real deal, people. If you love great whiskey and bourbon at a great price, then Balcones products are the only way to go. The whiskey may be made in Texas, but the owners are from Oklahoma. To find a liquor store that has it, visit balconiesdistilling.com and make sure you bank at First Fidelity Bank. First Fidelity Bank is a full-service financial institution based in Oklahoma with tailored solutions for all your personal and business needs. Checking accounts, saving accounts, home loans, and much more. They do it all. Whether it's online banking from your computer or mobile banking from your phone, everything is stress-free with FFB. Making mobile deposits, paying bills online, and moving money to different accounts could not be easier. First Fidelity Bank also provides free ATMs worldwide, making banking convenient wherever you are. They also give back to the community. FFB donates a total of more than $500,000 to local charities and educational foundations. Make your life easier and go bank at First Fidelity Bank. Visit FFB.com for more information. All right, for my winner of the weekend, thought about going with Cameron Smith. 34 under there in Hawaii at the century to win it 34 Ooh. under he earns 1.5 million there at that uh, there at Kapalua. Whoa. How about that? Whew. That's crazy. Big. Have you played that course? It is impossible. <laughs> <laughs> I've actually talked to, so Ben Crenshaw, this is so random, but, Gentle Ben Crenshaw was the guy that designed that course. And I interviewed him on my big 12 show. One time we were talking about golf and I was like, in my last question, I was like, Ben, I got to ask you just played the plantation course out there at Kapalua. What the hell, man? That was my last <laughs> question to him. And he was like, Oh yeah, that's a, that's a rough one. Dude's just tore it up. He was Cam Smith was 34 under John Rahman second at 33 under like what? People are ridiculous. Wow. Is the, is the, do you get like a, is it right on, I'm assuming it's right on the water. Dude, it like, you get there's wind some holes, you're in? like straight uphill and the wind is also blowing your, in your face. You're like, I want to die <laughs> right now. It's like, <laughs> I've never had less fun playing golf in my life 
than when I played that golf course. And that was before, like I started getting into golf, but so I'd play like once or twice a year. And I was just like, I remember I was playing with uh, Kent Rice, who is uh, my wife, one of my wife's family companies. Uh, Jeanette Rice is the president now uh, of American Fidelity. I was playing with her husband and we got through like three holes and we kind of looked at each other like, we're going to see, we're, we're going to keep going. Are we going to keep going? It was like, okay, yeah, we'll keep going. It was miserable. Well, at least you, at least you didn't play that course with like a pro. Cause that's whenever it's really miserable. Whenever you're, you are playing on a course that is way out of your league, you're having a horrible day and the person you're playing with or the people you're playing with are all like excellent golfers. And you just look like the horse's ass. Oh, oh let's stop talking about it. Also yeah. thought about going with TJ Watt, tied Michael Strahan's sack record, and beat a tight end and a right tackle trying to double team him. <laughs> and when he did it to get the 22 and a half sacks. And remember, he missed a couple games too and left a couple games injured as well. And the Steelers got the win in Baltimore. And as long as the Raiders and Chargers don't tie, the Steelers are going to the playoffs, which they're going to get killed by the Chiefs. But who cares? Pretty, pretty sweet for TJ Watt. Hell of an accomplishment. That's it's awesome. Um, that's big time. He can thank, um, I mean, thank the uh, Stefanski with the Browns for that because of p- not giving any help to that rookie right tackle. Yeah, we have four sacks, right? Yeah. All right, but my winner of the weekend, only one choice, and that is Oklahoma basketball. Woo! Big win over number eleven Iowa State. Before we talk about the game. TJ Otzelberger, that's that's a tough looking dude. That dude knows where the weight room is. When I looked at him, the first thing I said to my wife, I was like, that guy looks like he'd like to power clean with Ted. I was like, yeah, like he look, I bet you he does a little CrossFit, just a little bit. He he's an intense looking dude, man. Pretty intense. Um, I it was it was a good looking atmosphere. A lot of a lot of fans there, packed the house for the students being away. That's it's pretty impressive. I was told it got rather warm in the LNC. They Hot, may need to, huh? Yeah, they may need Ooh. to uh, check some things. <laughs> I had one guy DM me. He was like, can you explain to me why it was 90 degrees in the Lloyd Noble Center? I was like, I don't work there. Uh, no, I can't, but it's not supposed to be. <laughs> so but we'll see. But just a really nice performance from Porter Moser's squad, especially in that second half. Man, Iowa State, they have been a really – solid defensive team this season and the Sooners just lit them up down the stretch and I just I I I, it kind of felt like it was getting away from OU too early in that second half and you're like oh man this isn't looking that good Brockington had it rolling for Iowa State but then OU just dominated the last 10 minutes of that basketball game and I, I was really impressed with how they shared the basketball. I thought the passing on the offensive end was really, really crisp. Loved the, how balanced they were offensively. A big day from Emoja Gibson. Went for 20, did a really good job of getting to the free throw line. Now, Iowa State only shot one free throw in the game, which, yeah, I'll admit that's a, that's a little odd. But Harkless had 13. Tanner Groves had 16. He did some really good things in the paint. I thought Bijan Cortez made a Big time impact on the game with his energy, his passing, what he brought to the team late in that one. And they just did such a better job rebounding in this game compared to what they did against Baylor. Man, I that's a nice win. It's a really nice win because with the way that Iowa State was playing in that first half and the way that that second half got going, and I mean, Tyrese Hunter was really good for the Cyclones too, but. Sooners just whooped their ass last 10 minutes of the game. It's really fun to watch. Yeah, I can't remember who it was. I thought it was Gibson came down. Uh, he was coming down the left wing, and, and like it wasn't a fast break, but it was transition. And he just he tried to go to the hole and then went to, went to his left, and right there kind of at the elbow, kind of pulled up for like a floater type. It was just a bad shot. and. You saw on the Porter Moser on the sideline behind him went crazy and grabbed Bijan and like took him to the scores uh, desk. And when 
Cortez came in, he gave him an instant spark, and I, they went on like a 17-2 run whenever he came in the game. And just the, the passing from him, the, the ball handling, I, I thought he was the, the real catalyst down the stretch. He was great in that second half. Yeah. I, uh, there is a debate to be had about who had the best combination in the building of hair and basketball skill, Bijan Cortez or Josh Giddy, who was in the stands. I'm leaning towards Giddy, seeing he is playing really damn well for the Thunder, who took, who gave the Nuggets all they wanted on Sunday night. But yeah, it's Giddy. But well, Bijan Cortez was great. The pride of Kingfisher, baby. On that day, it was Cortez, okay? Yeah, because the Thunder didn't play basketball game. Love that. Love that That's technicality. Right. Big brain on you. <laughs> Big braid on you. All right, for my loser of the weekend, thought about going with Montana State, and I hate to say that because their starting quarterback was injured on the first series there in the FCS National Championship game, and they got steamrolled by North Dakota State. I watched I watched about the first five minutes of the game, and I saw what North Dakota State's offensive line was doing to Montana State, and I was like, I've seen enough. This is not going to be close. <laughs> now, there's no shame. there's no shame in it. Because the Bison have won, what, nine of 11 titles there in the FCS? Uh, Sheesh, man. They are just such a powerhouse. We talk about Bama. Now I know it's it's FCS, but still, to win it that consistently. And it would be 10 of 11 if Trey Lance wouldn't have opted out, right, for them. So just that was a... That was a beat down, but at least the parts of that game I watched, it was, it was not close. I, I saw a bunch of people using that as a way to push back on expanding the, the playoff as it is right now, uh, because they've won so many nine of the, of the last 11, but, uh, I, I don't even, it's crazy to put together that type of, uh, that type of success in North Dakota. Like, you know what I'm saying? I could understand if it was one of the places down South where, you know, players would want to go play, but man, that's, it's impressive. Yep. All right. But my loser of the weekend got to be the Indianapolis Colts. Oh, I mean, all they had to do was beat the Jacksonville Jaguars and they go to the playoffs. And not only did they not beat the Jaguars, the Jaguars kicked their ass 26 to 11. And honestly, it should have been more lopsided than that. If the Jaguars wouldn't have settled for a couple field goals, they have now lost seven straight in Jacksonville. The Colts have seven straight to the Jags in Jacksonville and that Colts offensive line, they got pushed around. Uh, Jonathan Taylor really couldn't get going. He had like 77 yards rushing. And 23 of those came on a play where two guys hit him in the backfield. He just somehow bounced out of it and made it all happen himself. They just kept trying to run in between the tackles on short yardage and they just kept getting stuffed and they just kept trying it. It kept getting stuffed. And I'll give Carson Wentz a little bit of a break. They didn't do a great job protecting him at times, but also the guy just holds on to the ball forever. (laughs) Sometimes it's just, and of course he had an intercept. Like he just, it, this was a game where everyone, like all the attention was on Carson Wentz. Everyone was like, all right, this game is going to tell us everything we know about what Carson Wentz is made of. And oh my God, it just, it went horrifically for the Colts and the Colts defense wasn't good either, man. I mean, they didn't tackle well, didn't force any turnovers. Jacks were seven to 15 on third down. Trevor Lawrence played one of the best games of his NFL career. And it was with a culture. All they had to do was win. And they were going to the playoffs, beat the worst team in the league that has fired their coach and has had all the issues, beat the worst team in the league who had hundreds of fans in the stands dressed as clowns <laughs> because they went the GM fired too. They couldn't do it. And not only did they not do it, they got their ass kicked. I, what was that? That's why I, and I try to explain this to people, but the cliche in the NFL, NFL is pro- maybe the only league where it's true, but 
it is incredibly difficult to win in the NFL. And the difference between teams that make the playoffs and and even the worst team in the league at times is razor thin. Here's the perfect example. You have a team that has I, every excuse to have packed it up a long time ago, right? But everyone's still trying to get stats, still trying to make plays. Guys are trying to show that they've got something. They know they're getting released, and this film is going to be all they've got for next season trying to catch on as a free agent. You just never know what you're running up against uh, any weekend in the NFL. And that's just, it's shocking, but hilarious at the same time. <laughs> yeah. But the Colts didn't know that Marvin Jones Jr. Uh, needed a couple catches to hit a half a million dollar uh, incentive. <laughs> and he hit it, baby, and had a touchdown. <laughs> but. Just a little insult to injury for, for the Colts. And I, I'm sure we have tons of Colts fans that listen to this, but Wentz played, you, you got to remember that pick for the Eagles was dependent on how much Wentz played. He played more than whatever. It was like 75% of the snaps. So the Eagles now have the Colts first round pick. So not only are you not going to the playoffs, you also played a guy so much that failed you miserably when you needed him most that now the Eagles have your first round pick. And if you're the Jags, it's the perfect scenario because you, you ruin the Colts season and you still get the number one pick in the draft because the lions beat the Packers. It's perfect for the Jags. The Jags just had an incredible day. Uh, that's so great. I love it. Uh, I can't wait to see who they hire. It's going to be interesting. I mean, Trevor Lawrence, a little bit of a glimpse into the future, you know, put together some nice moments there at the end of the season. No doubt. No doubt. On that note, episode 179 in the books. We'll have a new podcast that'll drop Thursday morning. Joe Thomas will join us talking Baker and the Browns. That should be fun. Just a reminder, you can hear Teddy from 2 to 6 on 94.7 The Ref. You can hear me from 3 to 5 on Sirius XM. Big 12 Radio, Channel 375. Hope you all have a great week. Until next time, we appreciate you all for listening. And do what you always do, Oklahoma. Take care of each other.